because we live in an age of unreality. We live in the age that Paul the Apostle spoke about when men will believe in delusions and falsehoods. And indeed, nowadays, if you don't believe in the delusions and falsehoods, then the mainstream political and media elites will tell you that there's something wrong with you when it's really they who think they're moths. And the main moth that they think they are is in regard to the jihad threat, the global threat of Islamic jihad and the spread of Sharia Islamic law. The uh, President of the United States and the Secretary of State and the Prime Minister of Great Britain and the President of France and the Chancellor of Germany, certainly, and pretty much, and the Pope, every leader in the Western world will tell you Islam is wonderful. Islam is peace. Islam is tolerance. Islam has made a positive contribution to the United States since its founding. And one thing we must never do whenever Muslims scream Allahu Akbar and kill people or blow themselves up is think that this has anything to do with Islam. <laughs> and that the first duty they all seem to think they have is to make sure whenever some Muslim does scream Allahu Akbar and then blow himself up in a crowd of infidels or shoot them down is the first duty that they have is to make sure that we do not think anything negative about Islam. <laughs> and so I think we are in the age of unreality that would have shocked Paul himself. We are in an age of unreality such that has never been seen before. An age in which unreality is enforced and commanded at the highest levels. And if we don't believe it, then we are racist, bigoted, Islamophobic, horrible people who are uh, full of hate. Now, while all that is happening, there really are Muslims who are screaming Lahu Akbar and killing people and hurting them. Just the other day in Virginia, there was a Muslim screaming Allahu Akbar who stabbed two people. Around the same time, within a day or so, there was a Muslim in Australia who was screaming Allahu Akbar and he stabbed a woman to death. And the Australian police said, this has nothing to do with Islam, yeah. you racist, bigoted Islamophobe. This has to do with he was in love with her and she spurned him. And of course, there are all sorts of stories all throughout history of spurned lovers turning into violence in all sorts of cultures. And so it's superficially plausible until you read on and you find out that when he was arrested, he was attacking the police officers. He must have, they must have spurned his advances as well. And he was known in the place where they were staying in this hostel for being violent and angry. So apparently everybody in the hostel had spurned his advances. <laughs> and even more common than unrequited love is mental illness. There are so many cases, I could spend the next hour going through each one, but it's, it, they're all the same. It's, a, it's as if they have a template. And whenever there's another Muslim screaming Allahu Akbar and stabbing people or driving into a crowd of infidels with his car or shooting them down and saying that, I did this in the name of Allah, I did this because I'm a Muslim, I did this because I'm allied with ISIS, whatever, then they immediately say, this person had psychological problems. Yeah. And so I think they, they must have a pad. You know, a pad with a form in it, and it says the at attack on such and such a date, fill in the date, and fill in the place, was not motivated by Islam, but was a manifestation of the person's, the perpetrator's, fill in the name, deep-rooted mental illness that had long been noted by doctors. And so I think, you know, the Diagnostic and Statistical, statistical Manual, the DSM, that is uh, the guidebook for psychologists and psychiatrists, the DSM Manual of Psychiatric Disorders. Uh, there ought to be in the next edition a new category of mental illness called jihad. <laughs> and <clears throat> that would actually, though, that would involve their acknowledging reality a bit too more strongly than people really want to do these days. And so we know that's not going to happen because it's too close to the truth. 
And the one thing we must not do is get close to the truth. And yet what this does is open up a yawning gap of cognitive dissonance, a gap that makes the Grand Canyon look like a superhighway. There is nothing greater than this cognitive dissonance gap. The difference is this. On the one hand, you have Islamic jihadis saying, I'm doing this because Islam says to kill or to subjugate the infidels under the rule of Islamic law, or to convert them to Islam. And I am doing this so that I can weaken infidel governments or terrorize the infidels in accord with the Quran, and it's all about Islam. And all of our governing authorities say the first thing that we must not recognize about this is that it has anything to do with Islam. There is, that's an absolute unbridgeable gap, and yet there is one way to bridge this yawning canyon of cognitive dissonance, and that is by actually looking at what Islam is all about. And so, uh, we're going to do a little Quran study tonight. If you would open your Qurans first... <laughs> to, you didn't bring it? I won't be calling it. Chapter 8, verse 60. Prepare against them what force you can, and horses tied at the frontier, to strike terror in the enemies of Allah and your enemies. <laughs> Same thing, chapter 3, verse 151. We will strike terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve, because they set up with Allah that for which he has set down no authority, and their abode is the fire. Chapter 8, verse 12. When your Lord revealed to the angels, I am with you, therefore make firm those who believe. I will strike terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. So that is, oh, and by the way, I will strike terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve, therefore strike off their heads and strike off every fingertip of them. You don't hear too much about the fingertip part, but a few years back, there was a Muslim in New Jersey who murdered two, he was an Egyptian Muslim, and he murdered two Coptic Christians, two Egyptian Christians. And he cut off their heads and he cut off their fingers. And when the bodies were found, the newspaper account said he cut off their heads and cut off their fingers so that it would be more difficult to identify the bodies. And I thought, no. He cut off their heads and cut off their fingers because the Quran says in chapter 8, verse 12, strike at the necks and strike off their fingertips. But of course, what could possibly be illuminating about Muslim behavior in the Quran? How could we possibly think that the Quran, the holy book of Islam, that they believe is the perfect and unalterable word of the only God, Allah, that was delivered in perfect form through the angel Gabriel to the prophet Muhammad, what could that possibly tell us about what Muslims think? Come on, get with it. You must be a racist. <laughs> but anyway, that just gave you three verses about terror. And so we have terrorism, striking terror into the hearts of the unbelievers that is strictly in accord with the dictates of the Islamic holy book. And so, does any of this have anything to do with Islam? I think those first three verses give us the idea that maybe there is something to do with, maybe there is something here. And so, let's go deeper. There is an entity in the world that the President of the United States calls ISIL. Yes. <laughs> and that everybody else in the world calls ISIS. <laughs> Except for John Kerry, who calls it Daesh. <laughs> do you know what Daesh is? Daesh is the Arabic letters for ISIL. <laughs> what is ISIL? The Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. What's the Levant? The Eastern Mediterranean area. Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel. In Arabic, the word for the Levant is Sham. So you get ISIS, ISIS, or ISIL, ISIL. On June 29, 2014, that group that called itself that changed its name, but they changed its name to the Islamic State. Instead of the Islamic State of here and there, they're just the Islamic State now because they consider themselves to be the caliphate. 
the sole legitimate government under Sunni Islamic theology for Muslims worldwide, the only government to which Muslims owe allegiance. And that's what they're claiming to be. And the global government, not only for, non -Muslims, for Muslims, but for non-Muslims as well. Of course, the president and John Kerry and all the rest of them cannot call it the Islamic State because that would mean that they would have to utter the word Islamic in connection with something Islamic. And they will never do that. And so they call it by its initials. And then if you were to ask them, what do those initials stand for, Mr. President? You know, no reporter's ever asked him that. Hey, what does that ISIL stand for? Barack? He would go running into the back because he would have to say the... <coughs> state of... etc., etc. It's, yeah, it's Islamic. Anyway, uh, is the Islamic State Islamic? And does it matter? In the first place, it matters a great deal. It matters a great deal because the oldest adage of warfare is you cannot defeat an enemy that you do not understand. If is the Islamic State is not Islamic, we need to know that. And if it is Islamic, we need to know that as well. Because whatever they are, if they're Methodists or Baptists, Presbyterians, probably <laughs> we need to know it because we need to understand who they are, what they want to do, how they intend to go about accomplishing what they want, and how likely they are to accomplish it. You cannot do that. You cannot understand any of that, and therefore you cannot counter it effectively unless you know what they're all about. And so the president tells us that the first thing that we have to remember about the Islamic State is that it's not Islamic and not a state. <laughs> Great, okay. But these are statements of fact. Statements of fact are susceptible to objective verification or refutation. And so it is in this case. Is the Islamic State a state? Well, they control a territory larger than Great Britain. They have currency, they have passports, although no other country will accept them. They have a health care system. You've got to have that in the state. <laughs> ISIS care. Yeah. And <laughs> don't lose your head. <laughs> and they have various government departments, various administrative districts, all the accoutrements of a state. And they control a territory larger than Great Britain. They also have subsidiary territories that are based on, uh, in other countries, controlled by groups that have accepted their claim to be the caliphate, notably Libya, Nigeria, the Philippines, Indonesia, Yemen, and elsewhere. They're a state. They're a rather large state, in fact. Now, are they Islamic? We must understand this question, as I explained, or we ain't going to be able to defeat this group. So what do they do? One of the main things they do, of course, is behead and they lovingly film the beheadings, and they show the beheadings on the internet, and the world is horrified and says, that was a big mistake, see, now they're going to start losing followers, because people are going to be repulsed by that, and they're not going to want to be associated with such a group. And I have seen the learned mainstream counter-terror analysts who know that ISIS has nothing to do with Islam say exactly that. ISIS is making a big mistake, Filming these beheadings and showing them, even Muslims are going to be repulsed by this. And they're going to start losing right about now. <laughs> and it never happens. And why doesn't it ever happen? Well, let's go to the Quran again. Chapter 47, verse 4. You remember that verse, probably from devotions. So when you meet in battle, those who disbelieve, then strike the necks. When you meet those who disbelieve, strike the necks. I read out in battle, but that's actually not in the Arabic. When you, it just says, when you meet those who disbelieve, strike the necks. How do you strike the necks? Well, that's kind of like beheading. And so the effect of that is that when Muslims who read this book and take it seriously and think it's the perfect word of Allah see those beheading videos, they don't say, oh, how repulsive, I will not join this group. And besides, John Kerry says they're not Islamic. They say, hey, finally somebody's doing what's in the Quran. Sign me up. 
And that's why they've had 30,000 young Muslims join them from 100 different countries around the world. And there's more. I ask your apologies in advance for the R-rated portion of our program, but it is coming up. So uh, what we have in the other thing that repulses people and horrifies people is that ISIS has seized many, kidnapped many, Yazidi and Christian women and made them into sex slaves. You've heard about this, no? And people think that's utterly barbaric. How could anybody think that that has anything to do with one of the world's great religions? One of the three great Abrahamic faiths. How could that possibly be? Well, let's go to the book. Chapter 4, verse 3. Marry such women as seem good to you. Two or three or four. Well, that's reasonable. And I don't really think it is. And if you fear that you will not do justice, then marry only one. Or what your right hands possess. What your right hands possess. What is that? What do your right what is what do your right hands possess? Chapter 4, verse 24 is a long list, because some people have to be told, of women that Muslims are not to sleep with. Forbidden to you are your mothers and your daughters. I mean, some people have to be told this. Chapter 4, verse 23. But then chapter 4, verse 24 adds, and all married women except those who your right hands possess. So we're starting to see what these poor women are for. Chapter 23, which is right before 25, 24. <laughs> That's why I always have trouble finding it. 23, 1 to 6. Successful indeed are the believers who are humble in their prayers and who keep aloof from what is vain and who are givers of the poor tax and who guard their private parts except before their wives or those whom their right hands possess. So it's beginning to become clear what these poor women are for, and where do they come from, we see from chapter 33, verse 50. O prophet, surely we have made lawful to you your wives, whom you have given their dowries, and those whom your right hands possess, out of those whom Allah has given to you as spoils of war. So, you have women who are captured as spoils of war in the context of a battle between Muslims and non-Muslims, and they're made into sex slaves. It's right in the Quran in multiple places. So is ISIL un-Islamic in doing such a thing? They are precisely Islamic. And it's very clear. You know, people say, well, you know, you really have to read that in Arabic to understand it. As if, kill them wherever you find them which appears in the Quran three times, chapter 2, verse 191, chapter 4, verse 89, chapter 9, verse 5. If somehow, if you will learn Arabic and you read it, it really means give them a hug. <laughs> but nobody who translates it can capture that nuance. <laughs> we live in an age of absurdity and unreality, and this is what we're up against. Another thing that the Islamic State did was when they came into Christian areas in Iraq and Syria, they demanded that the Christians pay a special tax from which the Muslims were exempt and accept the hegemony of the Muslims. They had to show that they were submitting to the Islamic rule and to accept various humiliating and discriminatory regulations that denied them basic rights. Now surely the religion of peace and tolerance wouldn't have such a thing in it. Except it does. Chapter 9, verse 29. Fight those who do not believe in Allah or the last day. And do not forbid what Allah and his messenger have forbidden. And do not follow the religion of truth. Even if they are of the people of the book, which is the Quran's name for primarily Jews and Christians. There are other groups that are people of the book. Any Zoroastrians here tonight? And... Even if they are of the people of the book, you have to fight them until they pay the jizya, which is tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. And so if they are willingly submitting and feeling themselves subdued under Islamic law, that make, takes form, takes shape, in that they cannot build new churches or repair old ones. They have to pay the tax. They have to get off the sidewalk if a Muslim is coming and always defer they cannot hold authority over Muslims. So that Christians in Pakistan, I often see it uh, in news stories that Muslims call them sweepers or street sweepers. 
because they only can hold the most menial jobs in society that do not involve having authority over anyone, because to have authority over a Muslim is not allowed for a non-Muslim under Islamic law. And so when the Islamic State demanded the tax from the Christians or their conversion to Islam, they were acting strictly in accord with this principle. And it's all in the Quran. Now, one major reason why this matters is because if this is all just something that the Islamic State cooked up in their extremism, then we can figure that the Obama administration's brilliant program called Countering Violent Extremism will take care of it. And they'll get those extremists. And if you extremely love peanut butter, watch out, because you're on their list as well. Any extreme is to be avoided. This is really Socrates and Aristotle in, in, in charge, because we avoid all extremes and are completely moderate in every way. But in reality, countering violent extremism is just a way to dodge dealing with the jihad threat and to pretend that there's an equivalent threat among faithful and observant Christians and Jews and others. But if we acknowledge that these things are indeed Islamic and that they have to do with Islam, well then, see, the Obama administration is in a lot of hot water because they're bringing in hundreds of thousands of Muslims every year and a million since he's been president, maybe I think more than that actually. And it could happen that the Muslims he's bringing in may think that they need to do these things as well. And then people might start to wake up, and this is why the age of unreality is upon us. People might start to wake up and say, wait a minute, why are you bringing in people among whom there is an unknown and unknowable number of Muslims who believe that it is their responsibility before God to kill us and or subjugate us under their hegemony and deny us basic rights and to institutionalize their law and impose their law here which mandates discrimination against women, discrimination against non-Muslims, denies the freedom of speech, denies the freedom of conscience, so that if a Muslim decides he wants to leave Islam, that's it, death. These things are inimical to the U.S. Constitution. They're completely contradictory to the U.S. Constitution. And it's, going, it's a, nothing but a recipe for civil strife to bring these people in in large numbers. But of course, he dismisses waves away all concern about that as a religious one-upmanship, that we don't like them because they're not Christians, and as racism and bigotry. And under those rubrics, which of course are the primary sins as far as the mainstream media goes, he's able to wave away and dismiss any concern about the violence and the societal upheaval that he is guaranteeing for our children and our children's children. And it is nothing short of criminal. If we had any decent kind of opposition party, he would already have been brought up on charges. But he knew, of course, when he first became president of the United States, that he had carte blanche and he could do whatever he wanted because there was no possible way that the United States of America was going to impeach the first black president and that the Republican Party was not going to dare try because it would make them look racist. Thank you. And of course, the other aspect of the Age of Unreality is Obama's treatment of the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is the other side of the coin. Iran is what ISIS wants to be when it grows up. And it is already an Islamic state that enforces Islamic law. It does not go in for those flashy kind of jihad terror attacks, which do terrify people, shooting up people in a nightclub, stabbing people on the street, doesn't, doesn't go for those kinds of things. What it does go for is something much more subtle and more insidious. The Canadian embassy from Iran, the Canadian embassy, the Iranian embassy in Canada, I should say, excuse me, in Ottawa, was actually shut down a few years ago by the Harper government because it was determined to be a center of espionage and subversion. Of course, there is no Iranian embassy in Washington but there are Iranian lobbying groups, notably the National Iranian American Council, which presents itself as a uh, lobbying group on the behalf of Iranian Americans and against the Islamic Republic's regime. But in reality, a few years back, there were a couple of Iranian dissidents who said, wait a minute, 
The National Iranian American Council is actually a lobbying group for the Iranian mullahs and on their behalf. And they were sued for libel by the National Iranian American Council and they lost. And it was established in federal court that the National Iranian American Council really is a lobbying group for the Iranian mullahs. And they have the ear of the Obama administration and they were telling Obama administration officials that it would be a great idea to have this nuclear deal with the Islamic Republic of Iran. And so now we have it. Now that is really far more insidious and far more clever than random stabbings on the street. Random stabbings on the street have a great capacity to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah. I am not minimizing them. But the effects, the potential effects of the Iran deal and the potential effects on the United States of Iran's global network of terrorist organizations, which are operating in Mexico and all through the Southern Hemisphere, could be far more catastrophic in the long run than anything that the Islamic State can inspire lone wolf Muslims to do here. And yet, Barack Obama has enabled them all the way along and actively lied about it. You may have heard of Ben Rhodes. Nobody much had heard of Ben Rhodes until Ben Rhodes made one of the most astonishing political errors I've ever seen anybody in power make. He is a top foreign policy advisor for Barack Obama. And maybe he just knew he was golden and he couldn't lose. And he may be right about that because he hasn't lost anything. He's still top foreign policy advisor for Barack Obama. But what he did was, a few months ago, he gave an interview to the New York Times. And the reporter for the New York Times loved him and was making him out to be a boy genius. You know, he's 37, he's on the rise, he's Barack Obama's top foreign policy advisor. Who knows what lies in his future? Maybe he will be president of the United States himself or king or Secretary General of the United Nations, or Pope, or who knows what, and maybe all. And since they're all essentially the same now. And Ben Rhodes, in an excess of self-congratulation, was boasting about how he had sold the American people on the Iran deal, because he shaped the administration's presentation of it. And he said that we got compliant reporters to tell, to report, that the Iranian regime was moderate, and that Hassan Rouhani, the president of Iran, was not like his predecessor, who you may recall, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who was always saying incendiary things. And Rouhani does not say incendiary things, but he is not by any stretch of the imagination a moderate. But he was portrayed as such by Ben Rhodes on purpose to make the Americans think that we were dealing with reasonable people in Iran who wanted to come to a peaceful accord. None of it was true, they knew it wasn't true, but they knew they had reporters in their pocket. And not cub reporters and interns, but senior reporters, respected reporters for respected journals like the Times, like CNN, like the Washington Post, all of them, who would report this and sell it and hoodwink the American people into swallowing this deal. Now, the problem with this is, what was the end game? What was the objective? The objective was, that this deal would be approved. The deal, even in the best interpretation, in 10 years will allow the Islamic Republic of Iran to get a nuclear bomb. This is a, a, a government, a regime, that its supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei, has said that Israel will cease to exist within 25 years. Well, what a coincidence. They'll have a bomb in 10, maybe it'll be sooner. And has repeatedly said that they will see the destruction of Israel. And they routinely, every week at Friday prayers, they are mandated, they order the people in Iran to chant in the mosques, death to America. Not only that, but an Iranian official recently said that death to America is not just a slogan. Death to America is the foundational philosophy of our regime. They really mean it. And they say, we welcome war with the United States. And they want it. And they think with Barack Obama being so weak, they can have it and win it. Not necessarily via a direct military confrontation, although they don't seem to be shying away from that. You may have seen that just the other day, they were harassing a U.S. Navy warship in the Persian Gulf. And it was reported when they captured the Navy, uh, the sailors, a few months ago. And they were parading them around as prisoners of war with their hands behind their backs and their... Uh, 
blindfolds over their eyes. They were saying that it came out that there were confrontations between the Iranian Navy and the U.S. Navy every day in the Persian Gulf. And Iranian officials routinely boast, if the Americans get out of line, if they cross the red lines we have established for them, and they were only able to establish them because the Obama administration wants to pretend that the Iranians are moderate and there's no confrontation. And so they shrink away from any provocation, no matter how provoking. And so they say, if the Americans cross the red lines we have established for them, we will take the war to the Gulf of Mexico and attack them there. And you think, oh, well, that's an empty boast, right? Well, as it happens, Iran has a wholly owned and operated subsidiary called Hezbollah, the party of Allah. It's a Shiite Muslim group in southern Lebanon, and it's set to destroy Israel. That's its job. That's what it wants to do. But Hezbollah is not just in southern Israel. They committed two terrorist attacks in Argentina in the 1990s in Jewish centers, killing very many, a great many people. They were behind the bombing of the U.S. military barracks that killed 200-some people in 1983 in Lebanon. They are very active in the Triple Frontier region in South America, the, the border between Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina, which is kind of a lawless area, very remote, and populated by a large number of Shiite Muslims, among which are Hezbollah. They're active in Venezuela which is, of course, another rogue state. And, above all, they're active in Mexico. They have t partnered with the drug cartels in Mexico. And if you keep up with the news about the drug cartels, you will hear that they've started kidnapping and beheading people. See, where'd they learn that? Yeah. They learned it from Hezbollah. Meanwhile, Hezbollah is profiting from the drug sales, and it is an unholy alliance. <laughs> not in order to control the drug trade in northern Mexico, but ultimately to get here. And so when they say they're going to take the war to the Gulf of Mexico, it's really not all that far-fetched with their wholly owned and operated terror subsidiary right south of the border now. But Barack Obama and Ben Rhodes tell us it's a moderate regime. Because, of course, this is the age of unreality. There's another thing about the Islamic Republic of Iran. The Islamic Republic of Iran is Shiite. Shiite Muslims are only 10 to 15 percent of all the Muslims worldwide. The other big group, the 85 to 90 percent, are Sunnis. Sunnis hate Shia and vice versa. And in Islam, because it's not a religion of peace, if you are a heretic, somebody with the wrong kind of beliefs, then you're under a death penalty. So Sunnis, because there's so many more of them, have killed and persecuted and harassed Shia throughout Islamic history. Now, there is a very helpful verse in the Quran that applies to unbelievers, but it also applies to heretical Muslims, or Muslims considered heretical, and that is chapter 3, verse 28. Let not the believers take the unbelievers for friends rather than believers. Okay? If you're a believer, you only make friends with believers, not with the other guys. Let not the believers take the unbelievers for friends rather than believers. Whoever does this has nothing to do with Allah, which is pretty serious. Unless you're doing it to guard yourselves against them. So you can pretend to be the friend of the unbelievers if you are protecting yourself against them thereby. Now, the classic commentaries on the Quran by Muslim scholars that Muslims consult when they want to know what the Quran is talking about they will tell you, they quote, as a matter of fact, Ibn Kathir, one of the foremost commentators on the Quran, whose works are still read today, he quotes one of Muhammad's companions. Muhammad's closest disciples are called companions. And one of the companions of Muhammad, Abu at darda said, this means we smile in the faces of some people, but behind their backs we curse them. And we smile in their faces to pretend to be their friends so that they won't kill us. But behind their backs we curse them. Sayyid Abu Allah Maududi, who was a Pakistani politician, he died in 1979, he founded a major political party in Pakistan that still exists, Jamaat Islami, and he was also an Islamic scholar and wrote a multi-volume commentary on the Quran. And in it, he wrote on his commentary on that verse that this means that occasionally Muslims under pressure may pretend to be the allies of their enemies 
in order to protect themselves against them, which sounds to me a lot like what Pakistan and Turkey are doing today. But in regard to the Shia and the Sunnis, it was the, the Shia developed a doctrine called taqiyya, which means concealment, that they would pretend to be Sunnis to guard themselves against the Sunnis and not get killed by them. Taqiyya was necessary because the Sunnis were very fierce at some points, very virulent and violent, and they would kill the Shia. So the Shia protected themselves by lying and pretending to be other than Shia, pretending to be Sunni. Now, what does this have to do with Iran? Everything. Because Iran is 99% Shiite, and it is the foremost Shiite country in the world. As a matter of fact, it's almost the only Shiite country in the world. Iraq has a Shiite majority, and it has a Shiite government in Baghdad, but the northern part of Iraq is all Sunnis, and they don't accept that government. That's where ISIS is. And Bahrain has a Shiite majority, and there's a large Shiite minority in eastern Saudi Arabia and in Pakistan and elsewhere. But mostly, the Shia are a tiny minority, and they're persecuted by the Sunnis. So, Taqiyya became, because this is a historical phenomenon, not just a modern one, it became a very important thing for the Shia, such that one of the foremost figures who enunciated Shiite theology, the sixth Shiite Imam, you may have heard of the twelfth Imam, but the sixth Imam, Jafar as Sadiq, he said, Taqiyya is the center of our religion, and he who does not practice Taqiyya does not have the religion. Now that's a wild thing. If you're not lying, then you're not a Shiite Muslim. But they, he said this because they were under such pressure. And so it was absolutely necessary, as far as he saw it, to lie and dissemble in order to preserve the community. But Iran is run by Shiite clerics who have dedicated their lives to understanding and protecting and communicating Shiite Islam. Do you think it's remotely possible that they might have been practicing taqiyya in regard to the Iranian nuclear deal? Do you think that maybe when they, Javad Zarif, the uh, foreign minister of Iran, was meeting with John Kerry, that maybe he was misleading him a little bit about what the Iranian intentions were? Do you think that a regime that is dedicated to Shiite Islam, and if Shiite Islam has as its central element deception, that maybe there could be some deception involved? And you're nodding. How racist. <laughs> but that's the world we live in today. That if you acknowledge reality, if you put two and two together and make four, then you're obviously a racist. Because everybody knows that two and two make five, that the Iranian regime is as honest as the day is long, that the Islamic State has nothing to do with Islam, and that we can bring over these migrants in large numbers, and nothing will happen except that we will march together hand in hand, singing John Lennon's Imagine, and entering a glorious multicultural future. That's all that's going to happen. Now, what's really happening is that George Soros, one of the richest men in the world, and one of the most evil. And his minions, his assistants, his, uh, his functionaries, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and others, they are dedicated to an internationalist, Marxist, globalist agenda. And the globalist agenda goes something like this. The problem in the world is military, economic, and political inequality. In other words, some states are more powerful than others, richer than others, stronger than others. And that's bad. Everybody ought to be equal. Now in reality, there is no necessary reason why political, military, and economic imbalances would cause strife. There was a thing in history called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, when the Roman Empire had absolute hegemony over most of Europe, much of North Africa, and the great deal of the Middle East. And there was peace, there wasn't conflict, because the Roman Empire had so much more power, military, politically, and economically, than any other state in the region. There was not less tr more trouble, there was less. Now, I am not advocating the return of the Roman Empire, although it might not be a bad idea. And actually, the Roman Empire is upon us. It's called the European Union, and it's very, very bad in its current iteration. But uh, the, the, the 
equation between military, political, and economic imbalance and warfare is not necessarily so, but it's taken for granted as a dogma on the left. It's unquestionable. And so Barack Obama was seen during the 2008 campaign avidly reading a book by Fareed Zakaria, you know on CNN, the guy who was brought up for plagiarism and nothing happened, of course, because he's on the left, so it's okay. And he wrote a book, or somebody wrote a book that he copied, uh, called The Post-American World. And the post-American world, Barack Obama was reading this book, he was deeply interested in it. And you could see, when he was on the campaign trail, going from car to airplane, or airplane to car, and he has his finger in the book on his place. And he's really absorbed in this book. And that book says that the problem in the world is that we have one superpower that has political, military, and economic strength greater than that of the rest of the world. So it has to be leveled. And if America were drastically weakened, militarily, politically, and economically, everything would be wonderful and there would be peace. Yeah. Now, don't you think that sounds like the Obama program for the last seven years? Yeah. And not only that, but the migrants are all part of this too. Because the idea is to make every place in America pretty much like every other place in the world, not just in America. And so, if much of the world is poor, dirty, squalid, and dangerous, then what they want to do is make every place in America poor, dirty, squalid, and dangerous. And then there will be peace. Because what will be the point of going to war? We're going to go, over to, war. We're going to, go to war and conquer that other dirty, squalid, poor, and dangerous place. Why bother? So the idea is to destroy nation states. The idea is to destroy borders. The idea is to destroy nationalism, to shame us into not, not into being afraid to be proud of our country and wanting to defend it. And to equate being proud of our country and wanting to defend it and proud of our culture and our civilization and our heritage and wanting to defend it, to equate that with all these terrible things, Nazism, white supremacism. I wrote an article uh, a few years back for a, 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 an essay collection, a book, and mine was about multiculturalism and why it was a bad idea. And I said, why it's a bad idea, essentially, was, I mean, you've got to find 12 pages ways to say this, of course, to write an essay, but essentially it was this. Judeo-Christian civilization is good, and it has been better for human beings than other civilizations. And therefore, multiculturalism is a step back and a weakening of the things that have made the world good. And the, what Judeo-Christian civilization has given the world, it's universally accepted notions of human rights and human dignity. Essentially that. And so uh, Southern Poverty Law Center or Media Matters or one of those leftist groups, they published an article saying Robert Spencer goes full-on white supremacist. <laughs> you know, you, you, you got to wonder about the honesty of people like that. I'm just not sure they're all that honest. Yeah. <laughs> but what they're trying to do is shame us into thinking that to defend ourselves is nativist, is hateful, is bigoted, is racist, to want to defend our culture, our heritage, our way of life is evil. When really, obviously, it is they who are evil because they are visiting upon, they're guaranteeing for our children and our children's children a, 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 a place, a world that is far more dangerous, far more violent, and far uglier than the world in which we grew up. And it did not have to happen. And it still really does not have to happen, although I think it's going to be a hard road back. The one thing that we have on our side is the truth. And that is the greatest weapon of all. Because the truth has a power far beyond any power that we have. Right now, it looks very bad. They control everything. They control the educational system. They control the, the uh, entertainment industry. So that our young people are brought up thinking it's not cool to love America. It's not, it's not, it's not with it to support uh, anybody but far-left socialists, and that socialism is the happening thing, as if it hasn't already catastrophically failed on half the globe and killed upwards of 60 million people. But anyway, Bernie Sanders is a charming guy. He wouldn't kill 60 million people, would he? Well, Hitler loved his dogs. Anyway. <laughs> the weapon of truth is more powerful than any hegemony they have. Because they, and they know it, and that's why they have to keep beating us over the head with lies. 
You know Goebbels, the uh, Nazi propaganda minister, he said that the big lie, you get the big lie across by constant repetition until people finally believe it. And I, I remember that all the time because I have a website, jihadwatch.org, where I track jihad activity and uh, publish news and commentary on jihad, jihad activity in the U.S. and around the world every day. And every time there's a major jihad attack, a jihad massacre in which multiple people are killed, I see it happen again. New York Times, CNN, Washington Post, they all come out with articles explaining how Islam is really a religion of peace, all the Muslims condemn this, and this has nothing to do with Islam. Anybody who thinks otherwise is a racist, bigoted Islamophobe. Every darn time. And not only that, when ISIS took the sex slaves and I ran you through the sex slave verses in the Quran, I saw an article in CNN by a Muslim saying Muhammad would have rejected this, that this is completely un-Islamic. And so I was looking to see, well, how is he going to explain these verses about the captives of the right hand? How is he going to say that they have some other meaning or they don't apply in the modern age? What's he going to do? Well, you know what he did? He didn't even mention them. And he knew, see, he knew that his, his readers, most people haven't read the Quran, and so they're not going to know that these verses are in there, and they're going to think, here's a Muslim saying that's un-Islamic. How nice, we've got nothing to worry about. This is just a bunch of extremists, and we all have our extremists. But we have the power of truth. And the truth has a power that is far beyond anything they can do, no matter how much they beat us over the head with this nonsense. Because the truth is just reality. And you can't keep people from knowing reality. As much as this is the age of unreality, all we have to do is open our eyes and look at it. And so we see these guys screaming Allahu Akbar and stabbing and killing people every day now. No matter how many times they tell us it's mental illness or unrequited love, it's obvious, it keeps happening. Why is there this global outbreak of mental illness and unrequited love? And so I remember when I was a young man uh, during the Civil War. <laughs> No, uh, when I was a young man in the 1980s, and uh, people were furious with Ronald Reagan, and I was too, actually. I was a young leftist then. I got better. And uh, <laughs> Ronald Reagan was being very confrontational with the Soviet Union. He was calling it the evil empire, and he was saying, he prophesied that it would soon fall. And people said, what a fool. See, he's just a, a, a senile actor. And what does he know? We should have elected a professional. Or a real politician who knows, you know? Jimmy Carter would have taken care of this. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and Ronald Reagan said these things and people were saying, the Soviet Union, Mr. Reagan, the Soviet Union is here to stay. We have to find some accord. And that was indeed the conventional wisdom. That was the State Department authorities' wisdom, the experts in foreign policy's wisdom. The Soviet Union is here for the indefinite future, and we have to learn to live with it, and so we have to find an accord. That was the Nixon, Ford, Carter, detente policy that Reagan ended. And everybody thought, what is this witless cowboy doing? We have to have detente. It's the only way into the future. And he was right. It was just a few years later, the wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed. He understood that it could not withstand the pressures he was putting it under, and that it was an edifice ultimately built on lies, and so all it needed was enough pressure and it would collapse, and it did. He saw it, nobody else saw it. And nowadays I am confident that even though the forces of evil and the forces of deception and lies and the forces that are mandating this unreality and beating us over the head with it, they have all the power and all the control. They have the politic, the political sphere, they have the media, they have the educational system, but all they have are lies. And lies ultimately are going to collapse of their own weight. Now, I'm not guaranteeing it's going to happen in three years like it did in the middle of the 80s when we never, nobody ever saw it coming but Ronald Reagan. But it could happen in 100 years. But I know that if we stand for the truth and we refuse to back down, and we refuse to accept the lies, and in our own sphere of influences, wherever we are, we insist that the truth be told, and not accept from our elected officials anything less, and not accept from those who are sworn to protect us anything but protection, then 
the, the lies will not win out because the truth has a compelling power beyond any propaganda. And so it could be, if we put up the pressure, it could be very soon that this collapses. Actually, I'm quite confident. If I had come here a year ago, I would have been much gloomier than I am tonight. I am far more confident now than I was a year ago today. And that is because of two things. One is the Brexit vote. Yes. And that showed that people are fed up in Britain. And all the polls were saying, oh, they're going to vote to remain in the European Union. But the people were fed up and they were not going to vote for remaining in the European Union while the European Union is inundating them with these Muslim migrants who are going to destroy Britain and bring it to a future of civil strife. And so they voted. And also there's the candidacy of Donald Trump. The candidacy of Donald Trump is extraordinary because like Ronald Reagan, he was not a career politician. And he's even less of a career politician than Reagan was because of course Reagan had a successful two terms as governor of California. But Donald Trump represents a deep threat to the political and media elites. He does not toe the politically correct line. They thought they had him dead many, many times throughout the primary season and up to now. They have counted him out so many times because he has violated politically correct sensibilities. And he said, there's no doubt, he's boorish and he says some things, he's rude, says some things that I wouldn't say because I'm a harmless fellow. But <laughs> the fact is that people are responding to him because he's actually speaking to their real concerns and because he's an actual person who says things that packaged, processed, focus grouped politicians don't say. You know, we have had enough, we've had it up to here with politicians who read the polls and then tell us in carefully rehearsed tones what we want. And you know, I see Hillary Clinton speak and it makes me sick. Um, because she's just speaking in these cliche, cliche after cliche. Together we will march into the future. Okay, okay what does that mean? <laughs> Dig into your wallets. Yeah. <laughs> and Donald Trump is actually speaking to what people are really worried about. He says build the wall and end Muslim immigration. And of course, nowadays they're trying to get him on saying he's backtracking on both of those, when I think probably more likely is he's trying to formulate ways in which they could be practicably done. But the point is, is that take the wall and, well, take both actually, the, the Muslim immigration thing rather. And why does he want to end Muslim immigration or put a temporary moratorium on it or whatever? Or a temporary moratorium on terror supporting states, immigration from them, etc. Why? Because jihadis come in among the immigrants. That's obvious. We have seen that happen already. In Paris, it was two refugees among the shooters who killed 130 people in November 2015. In San Bernardino, one of the shooters had passed five separate background checks from five different U.S. agencies. So, he's addressing a real problem. And <clears throat> he's called Hitler for it. Now, Hitler prevented the Jews from emigrating so that he could kill them. Trump wants to prevent Muslims from immigrating so they can kill us. You see how those things are not actually quite the same. And nobody who's been calling him Hitler, nobody has come up with any alternative plan for keeping jihadis out. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and all the rest of them would just rather Americans get killed in terror attacks than do something politically incorrect as to stop Muslim immigration. But the truth is against them, and reality is against them. And so they may win this election, and they may clamp down even more. They're no friends of the freedom of speech, and so it's a good thing I'm here now, because this time next year, I could be in Hillary's jail with that Muhammad filmmaker. Yeah. <laughs> But they will not be able to stop the truth. And it's going to get them. It never fails. And so I encourage you to take heart, but above all, I encourage you to work, to fight for this. This is a war. It's not a shooting war, and I hope it never becomes one. But it is a war, and we are the soldiers. The U.S. Army is not going to do this for us. It's not a shooting war. We are in the war of the information battle space and have to fight for it and tell the truth, insist on the truth, stand on the truth wherever we are, in whatever sphere that we have. 
and demand that we get it from the people we support for political positions. And never, ever back down or be intimidated. These people thrive on intimidation. And the great thing about them, people who are bullies and intimidators is that all you have to do is stand up to them and stand your ground, and then they get scared. And so be of good heart. We can win this thing. It's going to be difficult, but we have the greatest, foremost weapon on our side. And so ultimately, we can't lose it all. Thank you very much.